Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Maria Yudaniakovidis, and um, I'm a conservation architect. And today I would like to talk about uh, the prospects for revival of two significant heritage sites in the demilitarized zone in the island of Cyprus. In light of the current peace negotiations in Cyprus, this presentation aims to investigate the prospects for the revival of built heritage that suffered as a result of conflicts and neglected due to the buffer zone status. This paper is concerned with two sites, the Famagusta Wall City and the Nicosia Airport. These have varied and complex issues that arise from their production. My motivation is the fact that this heritage has multicultural values, global significance and interest, and potential to be a pilot project for a new approach, revival and implementation of built heritage in buffer zones. The presentation focuses on the significance of the sites, their past, present, and future. Examines how the political history and status quo affected the sites and explores a vision for the future. The peace negotiation provide an opportunity to establish new implementation guidelines for the heritage future. The political history of Cyprus has been determined by its irresistible geographical position, a gateway to Europe, Asia, and Africa. A turbulence history that derives from the Neolithic era to the 20th century, over which many civilizations have left their footprints. The island's independence in 1960 was sadly followed by a series of internal conflicts, which resulted in the Turkish invasion that caused the division of this tiny island and the destruction of cultural heritage sites. The 21st century has been an era of continuous attempts and strenuous efforts to resolve the political status, the separation of the two communities. With the Greek Cypriots living in the Republic of Cyprus in the south, and the Turkish Cypriots in the north in the de facto Turkish Cypriot administration. Following the EU membership in 2004, important steps towards confidence building and cooperation have emerged by undertaking projects of shared heritage funded by EU and supervised by the United Nations Development Programme. The EU requested a feasibility study of the cultural heritage in the northern Cyprus, which aimed to restore heritage assets at risk. The advisory board was set up and the bicommunal technical committee was established. 2,800 built heritage assets were identified and over 40 restoration projects were carried out. A recent project is the Apostolos Andreas Monastery, which you can see here, which was named as a landmark and symbol of perseverance, unity and peace by the senior program manager in the UNDP in Cyprus. Now, in light of this current positive intercommunal scenery, it is vital to, to acknowledge that shared heritage that has suffered decades of neglect because of its proximity to the buffer zone restricted areas. The buffer zone stretches from the east, and is the green line you see there, from the east of the island to the west. It's 112 miles long and covers an area of 134 square miles. It was established in 1964, following intercommunal conflicts, and extended in 1974. In 2003, the rules covering the bodies were relaxed, allowing Cypriots to travel across through certain security points. The buffer zone status has affected two significant sites, the Famagusta medieval wall city, which is on the right hand side of a very small circle at the top, which is um, adjacent to the UN restricted zone, the big pink area down there, which is the UN restricted zone and is known to Cyprus as the coast city of Arosha where the Nicosia Airport is in the middle of the island and is in the Nicosia UN restricted zone. The site's archaeological, architectural and historical significance is highlighted with a brief look at their history. Famagusta. Its rich history derives from 1600 BC, 
a prehistoric port for copper export, a Hellenistic prominent kingdom, a Roman and Byzantine commercial center, a wealthy marketplace under the Lusinians. Its golden era, however, began after the fall of Acre. The city's economic, cultural, and religious prosperity has accelerated. An influx of Christian refugees settled and transformed it into an important interpot between East and West, with merchants from various nationalities, very similar to what Constantinople was at the time. It was known to have 365 churches of various Christian denominations. Under the Genovese, it declined, but it was fortified and flourished again as a Venetian colony. Then it was raided and sieged by the Ottomans, and the churches were ruined or converted to mosques. The Christians fled to build the city of Varosha. Under the British rule, with the reconstruction of Ishapur, it became a strategic naval outpost overlooking the, West, the Suez Canal. And Lart, the French archaeologist and historian who recorded the medieval buildings in Cyprus in the late 19th century, in his book Gothic Art and Renaissance Cyprus, gave us a detailed account of the monuments, including 17 churches that have survived. After 1960, conflicts between the two communities forced their separation. The Turkish Cypriots lived in the walled city and the Greek Cypriots developed Varosha. Despite the conflicts, soon the region was flourishing again culturally and economically and became a large commercial and tourist resort. Then in 1974, it was bombarded and the Greek population fled to safety. Varosha was sealed off by the UN and became the ghost city. The churches were looted, converted, neglected. Famagusta's churches the survived churches represent the city's golden era. Their authenticity and architectural integrity are retained, an architectural confluence of styles from regions nearby and further afield. These are fine examples of medieval church architecture and the most diverse architectural treasure, in my opinion, that has ever been built in any other medieval city. I studied Famagusta's medieval churches as part of my PhD thesis carrying out a comparative study of the churches that were built between the 12th and 16th century on the island enabled me to identify two styles, the Byzantine and the medieval. I was intrigued to find that at the end of the 14th century in Famagusta, a unique indigenous style was created, the Franco-Byzantine style. It represents the ingenuity of the masons and builders who earlier worked on medieval Gothic cathedrals. They utilize their knowledge and skills to adapt in their designs the local materials, construction techniques, and Byzantine architectural forms. The churches of the walled city represent three groups of styles, the Frankish Gothic, the medieval other denominations, and the Franco-Byzantine. In the first group, the Franco-Gothic, we can read the medieval architectural language that was in use at the time in Western Europe. And Lart suggests that the architects of the St. Nicholas Cathedral had copied the Reims Cathedral design. The two pictures on the left is the two cathedrals. In another group of churches, it was interesting to identify influences from various Christian denominations, such as Armenian, Maronite, Jacobite, Nestorian, Hospitaliers. And in the Franco-Byzantine style, we identified three sub-styles based on the influences they implement. The Byzantine, Franco-Byzantine, the church in the middle, Hagia Zoni, the medieval Franco-Byzantine, St. George's and St. Paul's and Peter's, and the new Franco-Byzantine, the one on the left. The survived churches testify those that have been erased from the cityscape. The, the city is an unexplored archeological site. The proximity of the walled city to the ghost city diminishes its heritage value. It is a vulnerable site, a very unpleasant site. Despite the building's resilience, the decades of destruction, misuse, neglect, and the inappropriate repairs resulted a considerable degree of structural instability and erosion. Its significance has been briefly assessed by university scholars, and the city was included in the World Monuments Watch List in 2008 and 10 and an art project was funded by the World Monuments Fund in 2012. And recently, EU funded some 
uh, restoration projects and a sustainability study to support the cultural heritage and consolidate some of the structures at risk. Now let's have a look at our second site. The Nicosia International Airport is the first ever international airport on the island and it was built in the 1930s to be used as an RAF base. It was extended during the Second World War by a local construction company, a JMP, and uh, commercial flights were initiated in 1948, and the following year the first terminal was built. A modern new terminal was opened in 1968, designed by Deutsche German, a German aviation firm still with international reputation. The terminal was in use for less than a decade and plans were in place for its expansion but were never implemented due to the Turkish invasion. Soon after, the UN declared the buffer zone restricted area and operated the airport until 1977, then abandoned it to decline, but continued to use the site as UN headquarters. The building is a unique example of postmodern aviation architecture and no one of its kind has survived intact anywhere else. Despite its neglect, it has preserved all the original architectural features and its structural integrity. Its protection by the UN prevented any intervention, vandalism, or misuse. My proposal. Could enhance protection status ensure these two sites revival? A global recognition with an enhanced protection could contribute to the enhancement of their value, their restoration, and revival. It could bring cultural and economic prosperity. It would encourage investment with shared benefits and a positive impact on the efforts for a viable future. The attributes of the two sites, I believe, fulfill the criteria of authenticity, integrity, outstanding value to be included in the International Register of Cultural Property under special protection, enhanced protection, or heritage at risk. This heritage requires immediate enhancement measures adequate protection, appropriate repairs and restoration, management measures, and more importantly, a new life for the intercommunal benefit. The cultural and architectural significance and value of the two sites have been affected by the conflicts and the decades of, ne and the decades of neglect. In light of the current peace negotiation, this shared heritage has the opportunity to be revived and re-implemented for the future generations. The work of the UN on heritage has been exemplary so far. It is time to go even further to secure their enhanced protection, contributes to release the restriction status uh, uh, now, and allow the revival of, as shared heritage projects. Okay. From Augusta side, uh, sorry, Famagusta site cultural heritage is a testimony of centuries continued confluence of civilizations. Its intercultural history is significant to the identity of the societies that still reside on the island and beyond. It is a unique architectural site. Its architectural treasure should become a heritage tourist attraction and an archaeological research site for scholars. Well, the Nicosia Airport represents an example of European aviation architecture of the 20th century. It reflects its designer's ingenuity, a resilient concrete structure that has survived intact despite the 40 years of abandonment. Its structural integrity and authenticity suggest that it is an example of outstanding universal value. There is a great interest and plethora of ideas in an academic level for its revival, with re diverse proposals as centers of art, music, sport, or trade. Heritage protocols and conventions highlight that the cultural heritage of each nation belongs to all mankind and provide us with the tools for safeguarding and protecting cultural heritage assets affected by conflict. However, the issues that concern these two sites differ due to the buffer zone status. Is a new charter or forum in this instance needed for the revival and implementation of shared heritage in buffer zones, no man's land? Could this built heritage be used as a pilot project for a new framework legislation that could give hope to similar cases in the future? Built shared heritage is a symbol of hope in any peace negotiations, and its knowledge and appreciation could contribute to build peace. Thank you for listening.